Well, church family, we're going to continue worshiping by reading God's Word together. And if you have a copy of the Bible, I want to invite you to join me in Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. My name is Aaron, and I'm the campus and teaching pastor. So again, let me say how grateful we are if you're a first-time guest or your family from out of town. We're grateful that you would be with us this morning for such a special time together. Um, And if you don't have a copy of the scriptures, let me encourage you, you're more than welcome to take one of the Bibles that we have in the back at the resource table. Uh, I have found that if I'm trying to read scripture, I I use the YouVersion Bible app on my smartphone. It's really good. And if you want a Bible reading plan, an audible Bible also to read scripture. Uh, But sometimes I can get distracted if you don't have it on airplane mode. And so sometimes there's nothing better than a good hardback or paperback copy uh, and we want you to follow along so that the other six days of the week when we're not together, you can, you can chew on this, you can feast on this, and, and have your soul fed by the Word of God. And so as you're turning there, let me remind you what we celebrated last week. Last week was Easter Sunday. Now listen, it's hard to remember what happened 24 hours ago, much less six days ago. So I want to remind everyone that six days ago we celebrated the risen Lord Jesus Christ. That the resurrection of Jesus literally happened. God raised his son from the dead. And what that means is that on Friday, Jesus died for the sins of humanity by the shedding of his perfect blood on the cross at Calvary. And by God raising him from the dead, that was God's affirmation that, Son, you have done everything required to provide forgiveness of sins and second chances and do-overs. And so we celebrated that you can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. If Jesus has victory over death, we celebrated six days ago that you, in Christ, notice I say in Christ, through faith in Christ, that you don't have to be afraid of death. And if you're not afraid of death, you don't have to be afraid of anything else in this life. And if Jesus is alive, which he is, he has victory over the chains of sin that might hold us down and hold us back. Jesus never promised that there wouldn't be temptations or hardship in life. But what this means for you and for anybody is that you are not helpless, you are not hopeless, but through the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can put one foot in front of the other and find peace and purpose and meaning and hope, and that changes everything. And that's what we celebrated on Easter Sunday. And if you and I actually believe that's true, if we believe that's true, I'm just going to suggest that it might, might be the most unloving and rude thing we could ever do to keep that news to ourself. If that is true, and it is, it would be so rude and unloving and, matter of fact, hateful for us not to share that we believe that the gospel that has changed our lives is available to change someone else's life. So the reality of us as a church is we want to know Jesus and we want to make Jesus known. And that simply means sharing the good news of Jesus with others. Now, when I say that, I know for any of us, when you hear the pastor say, look, if we know Jesus, we got to make Jesus known. Well, faith comes from hearing. We need to verbally tell others. And so for many of us, you may feel like, well, for a pastor or somebody on the platform, that may be easy to do, or you went to school for that, or it's something that comes natural. And you may feel, as many surveys and polls tell us, uh, overwhelmed or just confused. Where do I start? What do I say? Or even intimidated about what do I say and when do I say it? So I'm so grateful that you're here today because for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at how important it is for the church to share our faith with others. And one of the things you're going to see from Scripture today is that sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes it's just as important what you're listening for as it is the words you say when you're sharing your faith. Sometimes it's just as important what you are attentively looking and listening for in someone else's story as it is what you say in that moment. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see where this is true in Scripture. Would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? This is our way to acknowledge that Jesus is in this place, God's presence is among us, and that He can speak through His authoritative Word that has no errors and no mistakes. Luke chapter 24, let's start in verse 13. It says, Now that same day two of them were on their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. Together, these two were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk alongside of them. But they were prevented from recognizing him. Then Jesus asked them, what is this dispute that you're having among yourselves as you're walking? And they stopped and looked discouraged. 
the one named Cleopas answered Jesus, Are you the only visitor in all of Jerusalem who does not know this thing that's happened here in these days? Jesus said in verse 19, Well, what things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, powerful in action and in speech before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they ultimately crucified him. You know, but we were hoping. You know, we really had hoped that he was the one who was about to bring about redemption for Israel. And besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women from our group, they astounded us. They arrived early at the tomb where Jesus had been buried, and they reported that they had seen a vision of angels who said, Jesus is alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and they found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him either. And Jesus said to them in verse 25, How foolish and slow you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all of Scripture. Let's pause for a moment and pray together. Lord Jesus, we want to be about your business. We want to be focused on the things that you want your church to be focused on. We celebrate that you are risen and that there is power in the name of Jesus to raise people from the dead, to bring them spiritually into eternal life. God, we want to be a church that's faithful to tell others about you. But there are things you teach us in this text about how important it is not only to be ready to share our faith, but how important it is to listen and to invest in relationships as we do that. So God, we ask that you would bring so many people to faith in Christ in the days and months ahead that we won't be able to contain our excitement, that the news of this will spread throughout Middle Tennessee, that revival will take place. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would quicken the hearts and the spirits of your church to be part of your movement that you're doing in our community, in our city, and in our world. And we say and pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I mentioned just a moment ago that sometimes what we listen for in a conversation is just as important as the words that we say. Let's look at a couple of observations from this text. There's a couple of things that jump out at me that I want you to see as well. Now, first, I want you to remember that when Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem, it was the time of Passover. It was the time where devout and committed Jews would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate what centuries before God had asked his people to do. You may remember that God liberated his people from slavery and bondage in Egypt. And he had told future generations, you're to remember this forever. And so once a year, the people of God would gather in Jerusalem. They would remember that by the blood of the lambs that were slain in Egypt, that God had passed over and liberated them. And, and so they would remember that God rescues, God saves. It was at this Passover feast where everybody was in Jerusalem. The population of the city would have swelled. You even remember when Mary and Joseph would take Jesus into Jerusalem. You remember the story where Jesus stayed around in the temple and his family, along with many people in a caravan leaving town, they, it, it was almost before they were home, they realized Jesus isn't with us. He was back in the temple. Lots of families, lots of individuals would travel to Jerusalem and back out. And so these two disciples, we don't, we don't know both of their names, but Cleopas is one of the disciples who's walking home from the Passover celebration in Jerusalem. We don't know much about Emmaus as a town or a village historically, but we know they either live there or were headed that way. So they've been there for the festival. They've seen and observed and heard about Jesus' death and his resurrection, and now they're on their way home. And while they're walking on the road, they're discussing these things. I mean, that, that's hard to comprehend. Like, is Jesus really alive? How does that work? And like, the women told us the tomb was empty, and the Bible says they were, they were arguing with one another. They were probably discussing the validity of the women's testimony, most likely. And the Bible says that Jesus, what we just read, Jesus comes up and walks alongside of them on the Emmaus Road. Now, they didn't recognize Jesus. Scripture says that he kept them from recognizing his appearance. Now, listen, there, there, there's a number of reasons why he might have done this. I mean, ultimately, in what we just read, the ultimate reason was he wanted to lead them to a place where he could reveal, like, wasn't it necessary for me to do that? We read that just a moment ago. 
in verses 25 and 26. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to die? Jesus wanted them ultimately to hear the truth from Scripture that he was the fulfillment. He was the one they'd been waiting on. But they weren't able to see him. And so we we don't know exactly how that works or how that happened. You don't have to be able to explain everything in Scripture to believe in the promises of God, that they all come true in Christ. Scripture oftentimes talks about a veil being over our eyes, much like a bride would have a veil or a curtain in a temple would be a veil to separate certain areas that you can't see beyond. God did not want them at this time for his purposes to recognize it was him. Now, later in their interaction in this chapter, you can read ahead. We're going to use this chapter as a launching pad, if you will, for the next couple of weeks together as we study God's Word. They would understand who he was later, but for this moment, they, they didn't know it. See, a lot of times God is at work in our lives. He's at work in our midst, and for his purposes, he may not want you to know exactly everything that he's doing if he told you. Have you ever thought, when I meet God, I'm going to ask him this, this, this. What if he told you and it was mind-blowing and you couldn't even understand it then? It's quite possible God's at work in your life right now. You just aren't able to see it in a way that for his purposes he doesn't want you to. But he comes alongside these men and he hears them talking. And Jesus says in verse 17, what's the dispute you're having? Like, What are you guys talking about? Pretty intense debate. He asked them a question. It's the first thing he says. He doesn't show up and say, "Uh well, you know all that stuff? It's me. I'm the one. He starts, this is an observation I made, he starts by asking them a question. Now the men turn to Jesus and they're almost incredulous, like they look at him discouraged and they look at him as if to say like, are you kidding me? Are you serious? Like are you the only, this is all people are talking about. They're not talking about any sporting event, they're not talking about any Roman games or Olympics, like they're not talking about the weather, they're talking about this Jesus who was crucified and now there's an empty tomb. Are you the only one who hasn't heard about this? And they ask that generally, and Jesus says, well, what things are you talking about? There's another question that Jesus asked them. I find it fascinating that Jesus asked them a question. I mean, he could have just said, hey, here's." I mean, we should pay attention to what Jesus is doing. Jesus as our rabbi, as our teacher, as our Messiah, as God himself is modeling for us what it looks like to engage in a relationship to advance the gospel and the good news. I mean, He ultimately said that. Didn't you know this had to happen? Don't you know that I'm the one? And the Bible literally says in what we just read in verse 26 that Jesus began starting with the law, the first five books of the Bible, the prophets, and all the way up to his existence with them here. He explained to them in Scripture how he was the fulfillment. But he started by asking questions. And then he paused to listen to them. Verse 19 all the way through 24 says that he let them talk. He let them share. Now, I find this interesting, but this is an observation that I felt led to share with you. I think in the spiritual landscape ahead for the local church, there are a couple of really important life skills that we need in the spiritual landscape of the future in North America and around the globe. Number one, we need to ask questions, and we need to be really good at listening. You need to ask questions and be really good at listening. You know, when we talk about sharing our faith, for some of us, it's easy. We, I know what to share. Jesus has changed my life. I want to share that with you. And I, I said that sometimes it's more important to listen or just as important to listen. Listen, Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes from hearing, that a person can't fully understand the Scripture or can't understand who Jesus is unless they hear you profess it. And so that comes at some point. And for some of us, It happens at the front end of things. I've been on an airplane when somebody says, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, okay. So like, tell tell me what you get excited about. And I have just said, I love that Jesus saved me from my sin. And I know what my life movie looks like without him. And I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. And I praise God that he saved me. I'm in a relationship with him. Like I, I go ahead and just verbally share there. There are moments where you share. But more oftentimes than not, God opens up doors for us to begin gospel conversations by doing a lot of really good listening and asking a lot of great questions. You know, we have a mentor relationships ministry in our church. We have life groups, which are groups, they're they're modeled off of Jesus' relationship. He had 12 disciples that he hung out with. There are life groups that are sometimes groups of 12 or 14 or 20 people that meet. There, There are Bible reading groups that are groups of three or four. Within Jesus' 12 disciples, the Bible tells us that Peter, James, and John were the three that were closest to him. So our Bible reading groups get together and they study God's word together, groups of all men or all women, where you can be a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more honest, less people in the room and study the word. But we have mentor relationships. The Bible says that there were the 12, there were the three, 
And then John, who's referred to as the beloved disciple, was the one that Jesus was the closest with. And so we have a mentor ministry here in our church that if you're interested in like, hey, I'm growing, I'm learning, i got a lot of questions, I'd love to be connected with somebody who's just a little further ahead than me, like you can be connected with somebody who's walked with Jesus just a little bit longer than you are. And one of the most interesting things, I reached out to somebody I really trust and said, hey, this a couple years ago, and I said, what makes, you've been walking with the Lord and you're so gifted in the local church, like what makes a really good mentor relationship ministry? And they said, mentors obviously that love Jesus and know the word, but mentors that ask really good questions and listen really well. And this individual said, because a lot of people are told a bunch of stuff. You know how many messages come at you through social media, through the television? It's thousands every day. Okay? I mean, it, it really is. And that's maybe an embellishment. Like, it's at least hundreds. It's a ton. He said, very few people sit and ask someone their story and pause long enough to listen, to show them dignity, to show them respect. I mean, isn't that what's so beautiful about Jesus sitting down with the woman at the well in John chapter 4? He asked her questions, where's your husband? But then he stopped and he listened. He asked her, would you give me a drink of water? And she's like, you asked me for a drink of water? I'm Samaritan, you're Jew? Like, this doesn't work, okay? Like, asking really good questions. Because oftentimes someone will tell you something. They're not ready to talk about Jesus. And most people who do not know Jesus are not looking for Jesus. They're not looking for Jesus, but we believe. So they're not looking for Jesus, but we believe. There was a time when I wasn't looking for Jesus. If you've come to faith as an adult, were there moments where you weren't looking for Jesus? You were looking for certain things, but you didn't know it was Jesus, right? So they may not want to talk about Jesus, but they want someone to take an interest in their life. Did you notice what happened when Jesus said, well, what are you guys talking about? They share, because this guy was a prophet. He came and he died on the cross, and now he's gone. And we were hoping, I don't know if you saw that in verse 21. Did you see those four words? I mean, this is the Greek New Testament translated into English for us, but those four, four, first four words there in that verse are, but we were hoping, like what they share with him is clues about what they're after. You know, we really had hoped he was the one. We really had hoped he was the one that could rescue, redeem, and restore all of Jerusalem. And in other words, like we wanted to benefit from that we had hoped. Let me ask you a question. This is for everybody in the room, Christian, non-Christian. What do you hope in? What do you put your hope in? What do you put your hope in? Jesus asks the question. They start telling their story and their hopes and their dreams and really their need. And he's paying attention. Obviously, he's God, but he's paying attention here. And they acknowledge we have a need. Now, they mentioned Jesus of Nazareth, and we were hoping someone that you may ask, what's going on? Tell me about your story. What's, what's been happening they may not say Jesus of Nazareth, but they may tell you what they're hoping for. They may tell you what they long for. They may tell you what they're praying for. You know, several years ago, a good friend of mine shared with me. We were just talking in conversation, and he shared with me that he and his wife were most likely going to pursue divorce. I thought to myself, like, what? Wait, what? And he shared with me in the process of, well, let's just sit down and talk about this. Like, what, what's going on? And there was... A belief that like whatever we got going on in our lives individually that's not unmet or not dealt with we'll get married and that's that's really what we're after and we'll get married and it'll get better you might talk to somebody who says we're having some marital trouble but like it's hard but like we want to get pregnant or we want to adopt we want to have a baby and like that like we really think that's and I've had people say we really think that'll solve what what's going on with us and so there's no judgment in that it's just an honest statement many of us feel that way like Whatever it is we're after will fix or complete us, right? And we may get that thing. And so for my friend, it was a realization that like you, his spouse couldn't complete in him what was lacking. I mean, listen, when you get married, don't marry somebody. Listen, in movies and books, you complete me sounds awesome. Oh my gosh. Uh, it's so biblically not true. Can you imagine waking up and realizing that your spouse can't be your savior? Could you imagine holding them to that expectation and resenting them for not being able to help you? Oof. That's why when I officiate a wedding, I tell them, you should know, she probably won't remember anything other than the cake and the photos later, okay, and then just shaking hands with thousands of people. But here's the deal. You're not getting married to complete one another. That only comes from the person of Jesus Christ. Everybody in this room, everybody watching online, we're created in the image of God. And the Bible says God's put eternity in your heart. You long to find contentment and completion in this beautiful but broken world. 
that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus because Jesus is the gateway to the Father. He's who restores, removes the sin, restores us to a right relationship with God. And by the way, doesn't this make sense? Who other than the thing that created you can tell you what your purpose is, right? I made it for this, right? What does Swiss Army Knife do? Well, let's go to the company and find out why they make it. Why does it got all these gadgets? Why they, like, they can tell us what it exists for and what they were thinking when they did this and how they put it together. That makes total sense. Like, we don't do things. We don't enter relationships. We don't pursue jobs. We don't pursue careers. I, I know we do without realizing it sometimes. For completion, for identity, for worth, that only comes from Jesus. These guys are like, I had hoped. You may start talking to someone that's a coworker that you've never shared your faith with. You're feeling compelled by the Spirit that you should. But maybe the first place to start is taking an interest in their story. They may not tell you they're after Jesus, but they may tell you a need or a desire or a pursuit that is unmet. They're not content. And as they share, you're listening for cues in their life where you know only Jesus can fix, address, and heal that thing. Matthew chapter 9 says that when Jesus showed up in Galilee to begin his public ministry, it doesn't say Jesus showed up and the first thing he did was preach. Well, he went to synagogues and he went to temples to preach the good news. He did. But do you know what Matthew chapter 9 says? The first thing he did is he sat there and he looked out at the crowds and he observed the crowds and he watched the crowds. A lot of attentive looking and listening. And the Bible says, not necessarily from any one conversation, but the Bible says the crowd, Jesus was stirred to compassion for them. Do you remember why? Because they looked like what? Like sheep without a shepherd. They looked helpless and harassed. When you and I are moving so fast with our life, no judgment, it's between you and the Lord. When you're so busy and you got so much going on or you're multitasking while you're talking to somebody and you're not paying attention, you oftentimes can't discern the spiritual condition of their heart or how you can best help serve them and ultimately show them how Jesus heals, redeems, restores that thing that they're after. So shame on me, shame on us for being so busy. Lord, we repent of that. We don't want to be so busy with ourselves. Like to, to have gospel conversations with people, to share the resurrected Jesus, we got to get out of ourselves, less of us, and pay more attention to others. And that only happens if Jesus is alive in you. Philippians chapter 2 says Jesus humbled himself. He's God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. So he humbled himself, became a servant, took on our sin, laid himself down on the cross so that he could fulfill what his father wanted. That's our model. That's how we become selfless. That's how we become others focused and less focused on our own wants and needs. It all has its place. But we start paying attention to the people around us. I want you for the next 24 hours to pay attention to the people God's planted you near. Your roommate, your sweet mate, your neighbor across the fence, your friend in the townhome that lives two doors down from you. Like, I want you to pay attention to your coworkers, to the people where you live. I want you to start paying attention to the people around you and their lives. They have a story to tell. I found this fascinating. Like, if we will just be attentive. Now, now don't, don't hear me not say that you just listen. I'm not saying you just listen and God saves people. I'm telling you that we have to be faithful. I mentioned it. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes from hearing the gospel. At some point, you have to verbally share your faith. And when people see that Christians care about them and that Christians are serving in the community and Christians may have a peace and a hope that's not found anywhere else, hopefully they won't ever look at us because we act like we've got it all together, but they see that in Christ we've found something that nothing else in this world can do. And then they hear the gospel and they hear it come from you and say, the two match, I want what you got. So hear me say you got to share it, but oftentimes what you're looking and paying attention for and listening attentively is just as important. You know, this past week I read a story about a French medical professor. His name is Rene Lenec. Now, you may not know Dr. Lenec, but you have been influenced by Dr. Lenec from the 1800s in France. He was a doctor, and he was trying to help patients, and a woman came to him, and she described her symptoms, and he, 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 felt, he, he thought he was getting a, a handle on what she was struggling with, but she explained her shortness of breath. She explained several things, and he wasn't really like crystal clear with clarity about what she was dealing with, and she said, I'm feeling this, and I'm feeling that, and he felt like she might have heart disease, but I'm not sure. Now listen, he created and invented a lot of things, and so one of the things that he had been studying was acoustics. He was studying acoustics, 
And he remembered, this is random history from a sermon that plug it away somewhere and you'll win Jeopardy someday, okay? He remembered that he had studied that sound is amplified through wood. Like sound travels louder and stronger through like objects, through wood. And I read that and I'm like, no way. So I laid my head down on my desk here at the church, put my ear down, and I like scratch real gently and it sounded like somebody was scraping my eardrum over here, okay? Like it amplified the noise. So he said, I wonder if that would work if I rolled up a tube of construction paper and placed it over her heart and put my ear on the other end. And so Dr. Lynette rolls it up. He, he puts it right over her heart and he listens and he says, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, your heart doesn't function like it should. And the reason I can tell you that is because I'm listening to it. And he diagnosed this woman with heart disease. Now, the reason you know him is because his little invention became the stethoscope. Became the stethoscope, right? And when the doctor walks in and they say, how we doing today? How's everything going, right? And they've got one. You don't pay attention to it. You don't even see it. But oftentimes, doctors don't walk in and say, good morning, I have some medication for you, I'll see you later. They don't tell you the remedy first, right? What do they tell you? How are we doing today? What's going on? Like, what, well, describe to me. And usually they've got a chart from their assistant who's already asked you a bunch of questions. You're like, here we go again. Okay, well, here's what I'm dealing with, right? Listen, one of the things that physicians know is this. Every physician knows that attentive listening is one of the most powerful, powerful elements that contributes towards healing. If you don't listen attentively to the patient, you can't make a diagnosis. And if you can't make a diagnosis, you can't suggest a remedy or a cure, right? As you and I listen to the stories of others, I'm not saying that you go on Amazon and buy you a stethoscope. If I could name my neighbors, they are beautiful, they're creative, they're intelligent. I'm getting to know them. We've got a couple of mechanical engineers in our, in our neighborhood that we just learned recently. Like, beautiful, gifted people. I love them. Now, I'm not going to say, hold up one second and go, come back out with a stethoscope. They'd think I was a freak show, okay? But I want, here's what I'm going to do the next week. When I have a conversation with one of my neighbors, I'm going to act as if spiritually, I need, I need to do a lot more listening than I do talking. So you do whatever works for you, but spiritually... Maybe the Christians should do a whole lot more listening, attentively, and just like Jesus who looked upon the crowd and they looked helpless and hurt, someone might share with us, I had hoped marriage would, i, I tell you what's going on, I had really hoped marriage would be that thing, but, I, but it's not. I had hoped that when I got tons of compensation and climbed the corporate ladder, my parents would be proud of me. Anybody in the room, like your, your mid-40s, 50s, and what you want most is, is affirmation from your parents or from a coach or a mentor or somebody in your life? Like, I had hoped. Now, most people won't tell you that in one shot, right? Most people don't get that vulnerable and honest. It's tons of smaller conversations over time. So maybe if we'll just be faithful to listen and pay attention, someone might share with us where they're sick or where they're hurting, or where they're aching. They'll never say Jesus, but you'll know what they're after is Jesus. And you can say to them, maybe you say, I, I used to look for satisfaction in relationships, and there's nothing wrong with relationships, but I, I've come to learn that, like, you know, really, I find satisfaction in Christ. And it took me a long time. It took me a lot of hard lessons, but I, I discovered that. And maybe somebody hears that, and they, they want that. That's what I want. I still want to date. I still want to get married. Like, I still want to have a family, but like, I, I want to get that right before I pursue this other stuff. Or maybe you say, listen, wouldn't it be awesome if you, if you don't make all the money you want or you don't get the title or climb the corporate ladder like you want, but, but you have peace when you sleep at night? Because you know it don't matter what anybody else thinks. You measure it. You are good enough in Christ. What would it be like to live as if we believe that? Not just say, like, I believe that, but to believe that, right? Could you imagine how... how how powerfully full of potential that message is to somebody who's looking for it and they just don't know it can be found in Christ. Like sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is sharing the good news of Jesus with the lost and searching and trusting the Holy Spirit with the results. We faithfully share the good news of Jesus with someone who's lost and searching and we trust the Holy Spirit with those results. Out there in the commons area here at our church is a gospel conversation board. And you're going to notice it's a map. It's a rudimentary map of Nashville. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to challenge us. We did this last year, and then when COVID hit, we took all the yellow push pins down. And now that we're re-engaging and able to be here, many of our members are still at home. And we're not forgetting that. But like, if you're here and able and you have a gospel conversation, 
and you intentionally are listening well and you know I'm doing this because I care about them and I love them, but I want to hear well what it is that I can offer them in Christ. When you walk in here, grab one of those yellow push pins out of that bucket and put it up on the wall. We need to celebrate. We need to celebrate that God is at work and that sharing the gospel has the potential to bring someone salvation and hope and eternal life. It's not a gospel results board, though. Those of you that are results-oriented and you're like, I want to check that box, I want to punch that list and move on to the next thing, you're going to hate it because it's not a gospel results board. We're not saying like, oh, is this how many people come to worship? That's an important metric. Is it important to say we, we have X amount of people who've responded in faith? Of course it is. But our responsibility as a church is to faithfully share the gospel and trust the Holy Spirit with what he wants. And some people may respond in weeks. Some people may respond in years. Some people may respond in decades. But can I give you a promise that God says he'll honor? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men and women to myself. Jesus has said, now that's a prayer and that's an activity I'm interested in blessing. If you will listen well, and when the opportunity presents itself, whether it's on the front end of the relationship or somewhere later, share the gospel, I'll save people. You just be faithful. Woo! You ever seen anybody come to know Christ? You're like, sign me up for that again, right? It's awesome to see people. Like, God didn't come to make good people or come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people come alive. And when you see that happen, you want everybody to experience that, right? So here's what I want us to do. We, we need to consider what we need to put into practice from the text. Otherwise, it could be awesome. The songs could be good. Uh, we celebrated baptism in the first service. We've got these beautiful children that were dedicated. It was good to be in the house of the Lord, but nothing changes in our lives, right? So we need to put this text into practice. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you bow your head and close your eyes for the next couple of minutes?